recording this session and it'll be emailed to you along the slides um, within the next day. It will also go on our website, joining our archive of webinars. Um, so thanks again for joining our Intro to Public Works Contracting webinar. My name is James Forrest. I'm the Program Coordinator for the Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as NorCal PTAC for short. Our Procurement and Public Works Specialist, uh, Ed Duarte, will be the main presenter for today's workshop. And we're also delighted to have Patricia Silva, Silva from Caltrans D2 starting things off for us as well. Um, so it's going to be a good one. And this is uh, just the first part in a four part series on the topic, drawing on Ed's uh, extensive expertise. So we encourage you to register for the other three as well and follow along. Before we hand things over, here's the intro slide here. Before we hand things over to our presenters, <clears throat> I do want to give you a little lowdown on PTAC and the free services we offer. Um, so you can take advantage of them. We are a nonprofit program and we're set up to help small businesses achieve success in the government marketplace. We're funded mostly by the DLA, the Defense Logistics Agency. We also get extra grant funding from other state and local funds. Um, so we provide all of our services for free to the public, um, which is great because we, we want to be able to help you out and we don't want to charge anything. We're hosted by the Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation up in Arcata, California, where you see that red star. And last year, NorCal PTAC actually helped our clients win more than $268 million in government contracts. So that's a lot of money going into the um, pockets of small businesses that might not be able to uh, navigate this process without it. Um, every PTAC, uh, so there's more than one PTAC. We are just one of 94 across the country. Every PTAC provides three basic core services. The first uh, is one-on-one -on -one counseling. So we actually have uh, procurement specialists like Ed, for instance, who can meet with you um, directly uh, via Zoom or, or call or email. Um, so if your business is located in one of these counties listed in green here, we got 15 of them, mostly on the California coast and the northern part here. Um, we invite you to apply online on our website here at norcalptech.org and we can connect you with a counselor. Second thing we offer is a uh, regular in-person and virtual workshops like this one, more on the virtual side these days for obvious reasons. Um, and they're all on government contracting topics that we think that um, you can all benefit from. So they're open to anyone from anywhere, um, unlike our client services, but just, just for these uh, counties here. So you can check out our website once again if you find more upcoming events. And I'll be going over a couple of those later. Third thing we can help with is to set you up with a bid match uh, service. This gives you daily access to federal, state, local, and even prime contractor opportunities. So with this tool, you can be notified when a bid request is posted that matches your desired criteria. And this helps you stay on top of the opportunities made available for you. So once again, if you're one of the, in one of these counties, go ahead and apply with, for us. You can give me a call at the number at the bottom of the page here, 707-267-7561. Um, or give me an email at info at norcalcutech.org. I'll see what I can do to help you out. Um, if you're located somewhere else, you can uh, type in find a PTAC, and uh, that usually brings up the APTAC, APTAC website, where you can find your own local PTAC that covers your area. A couple housekeeping notes here. Um, to prevent noise interference, you'll all, you're all started off by default and muted for today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, we do encourage you to enter them into the Q&A window feature. So in this webinar format, there's a Q&A feature. Um, please don't enter them into the chat window because we, we prefer to just monitor the Q&A. Um, if you have in, um, any other sort of comments, you can put them in the chat, but Q&A feature, and then we'll get to them at the end. Um, at the end, you can also feel free to select the raise your hand option, and then we can uh, unmute you uh, so you can ask your question aloud to Ed and Patricia. Uh, but uh, if you raise your hand before during the presentation, I probably won't get to you. Um, and one more reminder that we are recording this session and these slides along with all the documentation and the recording will be sent to you and posted to our website where it will join the rest of our resources on the past webinars. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Patricia Silva here, who is our uh, uh, liaison with Caltrans District 2. Thanks so much, Patricia. Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Silva, and I'm the Small Business Liaison for Caltrans District 2, located in Redding, Northern California. Our district serves seven counties, Shasta, Siskiyou, 
Modoc, Trinity, Lassen, Tehama, and Palumas. Caltrans is made up of 12 districts, all from District 1, all the way from District 1 in Eureka, Northern California, down to Districts 11 and 12, located in San Diego and Irvine in Southern California. Every district, district has a small business liaison, such as myself, and our job is to assist and help educate businesses on how to find procurement contracting opportunities with Caltrans. Uh, this slide provides lots of great resource links for your viewing later as this webinar is being recorded for you. The next slide provides also additional resources. Um, there's a lot of PDF um, resources here for you. The SB1 flyer at work. Um, there you go. Lots of great information there for you. Please review the electronic bidding guide. Also um, a resource for you guys um, to review. Um, lots of great information there. Um, all, all you need to know about electronic bidding right there. And then we have our doing business with Caltrans brochure. Great resource as well. Um, go through it. it pretty much gives a good review on how to do business with Caltrans serving goods and services. What are some of the contracts that we procure? What are some of the commodities that we procure? So a great resource there for you. Uh, the next one is the small business um, brochure. So this is an overview of our small business program. Great brochure, um, gives you lots of information about certification, DBE, our Office of Civil Rights, our goals that we need to meet. Um, this is a really good brochure for you. Um, talks about the DBB small business certifications that Caltrans recognizes as our state certification, and then a DBE federal certification, um, which um, applies to our contracts that have federal funding money attached to them. So that is a great brochure resource for you as well. Uh, the next one is um, our, uh, just lots of um, good um, resource links there for you to view later. And then we have our DBE district map. Um, so our map of Caltrans, which is um, all of our districts, one through 12, and you can see how they're located and all of our contact information and also the supportive services at the bottom, which is um, a great resource for you for the Office of Civil Rights, has their contact information um, and all the supportive services that, you know, are included with um, this program. So great resource as well. So um, along with that, we also have all the contact information for you guys. Um, we have the small business liaison for each district's contact list. So you can feel free to reach out to any of us BSBLs in the 12 districts. Um, there's also the Caltrans Small Business Advocate, which is an email that you all can reach out to. That's our Office of Civil Rights, especially if you have questions in regards to DBE federal certification. Um, then there's also my email, and um, you can reach out to me as well for any questions, and I will research and do my best to get back to you. Um, and um, there's also the event calendar, Caltrans event calendar. Please feel free to review the event calendar um, because there's lots of events that come up within the 12 districts, um, free events such as this that you can view right there on our Caltrans event calendar. And um, thank you, and enjoy your presentation. And back to you, James. All right, thank you so much, Tricia. We always appreciate you uh, having you with us for these. Um, so next up, uh, we are gonna hand things over to Ed. Um, uh, by the way, Tricia will be around for the Q&A at the end as well, so you can feel free to direct some questions to her. Um, so I will hand things over to Ed Duarte. He's our NorCal PTAC procurement specialist and public works expert. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you, James. Just 
Good morning, everybody. I'm having a little um, difficulty with the slide here. Okay, here we go. Again, as, as you saw on the slide, my name's Ed Duarte. Uh, to give you a little background on myself, why am I the one that's chosen to present this? I am a retired general engineering contractor. Prior to starting my own company, uh, I spent six years, seven years, excuse me, as a Caltrans bridge engineer. Uh, construction, public works construction is what I've done my entire life. I uh, retired and turned over the company to my son and son-in-law. We have always bid on as prime contractors. So what I'm going to be talking about today and what I'm going to be showing you is nothing, there's nothing here that came from a textbook or from a state reference source. This is how we develop it, the process on the, in, on the industry side. This is what what you're going to see today in the next three weeks, uh, next three sessions, are uh, procedures, policies, and methodologies that the contractors use. This is how it's done. It is not theory. What we're trying to accomplish in this workshop is uh, understanding the bid and pay pricing process and the typical bid format for both primes and subs. I'm going, to talk to, I'm going to give you an overview on the basic protocol and the process of how to submit a bid. Understand how to develop a, profession, a professional, credible scope letter. That's, that is talking to you as subcontractors. Finally, I want to make a clarification here that I know I'm quite positive many of you in listening this morning are with the uh, architecture and engineering professional services uh, side of the business. I would love for you to stay and, and hear this presentation. But this workshop is presented from the perspective of construction contractors, not architects, not engineers, not even construction managers. So um, if you are not that type of a, a business, I, I, I welcome you to stay, but <clears throat> you might find a lot of this as non-applicable to your business. James, for some reason, we're having trouble. You having trouble? Yeah. Can you double click on the screen again, or the shared screen? Yeah, there we go. There we go. In California, all contractors and, and all agencies, public works agencies, are subject to the regulations of the public contract code. It has a set of <clears throat> pardon me, a set of basic requirements that apply to all construction contractors that plan on doing business with the state of California, with Caltrans, with a water district, a sewer district, a school district, a city, a county, et cetera. These are the basics. You have to have a proper license, a general contractor, A or B. The A license is the uh, what we call the heavy civil uh, the A licensed contractors are the ones who build your highways, your freeways, your bridges, your airports, your water and wastewater treatment plants. The B license is called the general building contractor. That's the one that builds your, the buildings. It builds the fire stations, police stations, city halls, school buildings, and um, all residential construction. The subcontractors are licensed under a specialty C category. For example, a C10 would be an electrical subcontractor. If you want to do a public works contract, you have to do, register with the Department of Industrial Relations, a DIR, every year. 
and that's $400 a year. And any contract that you work on, if you're awarded, will have specific liability insurance coverage, including workers' comp. And speaking of workers' comp, there is no such thing as piecework on public works. You, can't ha you cannot subcontract out to an one individual and say they are a uh, subconsultant and they're going to be doing the painting on your project. Everybody has to get paid a prevailing wage by the hour. And, and I'm speaking of the workers. Those wages are, as by, by law, definition, they're called prevailing wages. It's, it's a function of the Davis-Bacon Act, which in California is essentially union scale. If you're doing a job for Caltrans or the Sacramento uh, County or uh, City of Modesto, you will get paid once a month as the prime contractor, once every 30 days in arrears. So the obvious conclusion that you immediately arrive at is that you're going to carry two months worth of work without a penny in your pocket. There is no such thing as upfront money on a public works contract. All bid proposals must meet without qualification or reservation the specifications written in the bid documents. You don't bid what you think, you bid what is shown. And finally, if you bid as a prime, all projects over 25,000 will be required to be fully bonded with a performance and payment bond. Contractual requirements and general conditions, the bonding and insurance requirements as a prime and as a sub. There's a, we can talk about a pre-bid conference on job walk. There are union and non-union issues that need to be considered. And one of the uh, key so, uh, services that NorCal PTAC provides is uh, the general contractor outreach to subs and the subcontractor outreach to generals. The methodology and the logistics in, that in, involve those issues. <clears throat> Every project, as Tricia noted uh, in, in the um, website, I mean, the links that you can click on, there'll be all of these uh, points of information will be provided. The key one being the invitation to bid. And that'll be always in the uh, contract documents. So there'll be an invitation to bid that states the date, time, and place that the prime contractor has to turn in the bid. It will define the bonding requirements, a bid bond, a performance, and payment bonds. I'm not going to take the time to go into the definition of those. I've done a separate webinar on those in the past, but um, just remember this one thing. Bonding is not insurance. So it is very difficult to get. To get. I'll be talking more about that in tomorrow's workshop. The bid proposal form for the prime contractor is always included. I'm going to show you a sample of that later this morning. It'll be a description of the work, the insurance requirements, the DIR registration, prevailing wages. If there's a project labor agreement, that's a separate issue. Not all contracts carry those. If it is included, it, it will impact uh, whether you bid or not. There will be MBE, DBE, SBE, in other words, diversity slash uh, uh, minority contractor uh, participation requirements. Uh, that, that will also be spelled out. The information will provide what, how many days there are allowed in the contract to complete the project and what happens if, they go, if you finish late, liquidated damages. The type of schedule required, the submittals requirements, change order procedure, weather day allowances, the pay application procedure. Uh, when you get paid once a month, you also only get 95% of your check. 5% is always held in retention until the project is closed out. There are safety program requirements. Needless to say, COVID is affecting all construction projects in the state, public and private. A SWIP plan, which is uh, stormwater, wastewater uh, protection, erosion control. That's a, that's a key and mandatory 
a feature of every single public works contract. There's QA and QC requirements, and they will be very specific project closeout requirements. So, as again, as Trish pointed out, you can contact the Prime with, through the website, look at the estimate, review the bid form, review the list of primes that are planning to bid the job, prepare your scope letter, decide what you will bid upon, send the bidding primes your unpriced scope letter, begin working on your estimate, and then on bid day morning, send out your priced out scope letter. Steps one through eight is the logistical timeline of the sequence of events. I've been doing these workshops for 25 years, and one of the most common themes I always hear every single time is I turn in my bid and I never heard back from the prime contractor. Uh, as a side comment, bear in mind, I'm talking to you as subcontractors. Let me, let me digress for about 30 seconds here. If you are in, in today's audience, if you are a prime contractor, if you're a general contractor with the a or B license, and you want to bid on a public works job, <clears throat> I don't really have to tell you what to do because as soon as you get the contract bid documents, the bid form and the bid procedures, how to fill it out, what to include, when to do it, it's all there. Everything is explained. All you have to do is be able to read and be able to handle a lot of paperwork. So what I'm focus on, uh, focusing on right now are you subcontractors who you do not go through that process. You are bidding to the primes. A construction attorney once told me what a lot of subcontractors don't realize is you do not exist in the eyes of the owner. The owner has a, there's a reason for a general contractor's position. The owner has a one point of contact and all the subcontractors work for the prime. They do not work for the owner. Consequently, you will always have to follow that chain of command to get any problems resolved. <clears throat> Some best practices include start your own estimate early, do your pre-bid job walk, quantity takeoffs, develop your spreadsheet at least a week before the project bids, format your spreadsheet to mimic the prime's bid form as required by the owner. We're gonna go into that in detail when I start showing you the handouts. Send out your own request for bids from your own suppliers and sub-subcontractors, sub uh, second tier subcontractors, and send your unpriced scope letter to your bidding primes detailing what it is you're going to be providing a bid for on bid day. I'm going to talk about this again. I'm, I keep emphasizing this. This is the credibility that you need to establish because just calling up a prime and say, I'm an electrician. I want to bid on, on, on this school job or I want to bid on this bridge job. That doesn't cut it. You have to be very specific. I'm going to stop for a moment and I've, I've talked over some general general uh, comments and general uh, procedures. At this point, I think there might be some questions and I'm willing to take them because when we get into these handouts, we're gonna, I'm gonna be going into some very specific examples of what I've been talking about. So James, do you wanna handle the uh, Q&A and turn them over to me or? Sure, sure. Um... And let me just, uh, once again, remind me, a lot of folks are entering their questions into the chat window feature. We wanna keep that clear for any technical issues or administrative functions. So um, I won't be answering any questions from the chat window. Sorry about that. Um, but I can go and take a look in the Q&A. Um, and when you submit a question, it, it only shows up to all the attendees once we answer it. <clears throat> um, someone's asking, will the presentation be available after the meeting? Yes, it will. Uh, we're we're going to send an email and it'll also go on our website. Um, that is someone's talking about audio interference. If you live in one of the counties. Okay, uh, I see one about fabricators, James. Yeah, I'm just going through. What about fabricators? Yeah. 
Okay, fab fabricators uh, like a structural steel fabricator are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the, that's the typical one, cabinet shop. There's another fabricator. They will be bidding to the subcontractor and that subcontractor will be bidding to the prime. <clears throat> if it's, um, <clears throat> if, if the fabrication uh, material does not fall under a specific C10, C12, C license subcontractor category, the fabricators can and always will be able to bid directly to the prime. Um, Noah Lee is asking for construction project suppliers. Do we submit our bids to the prime contractor or to the subcontractors? That would depend on what it is you supply. For example, if you supply safety equipment, you probably will be submitting directly to the prime. If you supply electrical switchgear, you definitely will be bidding only to the electrical subcontractors. Um, anonymous attendee asked at 1027, are they considered a vendor or sub? I'm not sure what they are referring to, do you know? 1027, just a minute ago. Oh, I think, no, I don't know. They're talking about A and E. Uh, the only time an A and E would be involved with a prime contractor <clears throat> is on a specific type of contract delivery method called design build. And that's where the A and E works as a sub consultant to the prime contractor and they would bid as a team. <clears throat> Uh, Mary Verdon is asking, do any of your resources help with completing forms 10-H and 10-K, or will that be cover covered in the coming estimating and bidding webinars? Where is that 10-H um, and 10-K? Uh, well, maybe it's, um, maybe the fact that I've been retired for a couple of years, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with 10-H and 10-K are. If you could submit that as a separate question, <clears throat> I'll try to answer it later. Yeah, if there's any questions that go unanswered, that's um, you, you attendees are welcome to email me at info at norcalptech.org and I will um, direct them towards adding or we can do some research to get an answer to your question. I see a question from, um, I see a question from Claudine. <coughs> Where she says, I have <clears throat> an asphalt sweeper. I uh, have not been able to find those services detailed in the scope of primes. Um, typically on a brand new street project, you don't need an asphalt sweeper. But <clears throat> most general contractors who are road builders do their own asphalt work. They would never sub out the actual lane of the blacktop. <clears throat> so if you were an asphalt sweeper, you might be, uh, it might be better to look at a county road project and bid to a smaller contractor. Um, I think that's about all I could offer on that one. On the next one, there's a standard section of the specs on site security requirements. Uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> uh, sometimes you'll see uh, specifications uh, regarding site security. The reason that you most often do not is because the, con the owner would love nothing better than to leave that responsibility up to the contractor. So uh, when, when our company bids on building projects, uh, we assess the neighborhood where we're going to be building that project. And if it warrants a guard dog or, or, a, or an armed guard or a security guard of any type, we, we have to handle that. That's, because if any theft and vandalism occurs on the, on the site, it is not a problem for the owner. It's our problem. We have to address that. So no, I don't think you're gonna find security requirements, except possibly at a prison. Now we've done a prison project and they have very specific site required requirements. Uh, next question, if we use a sub, how do we pay them? Do we pay the worker, then the company? No. If you, if you are a, 
I'll answer that, but there's two answers. If you're a prime contractor, you will be paying the sub a lump sum monthly progress payment. And it is up to the subcontractor to pay their workers. If you have your own workers, obviously you, it's, it's a regular paycheck. Are there many projects that are just bid for design? Again, that's talking about the A&E firms. No, and the reason that, I'm, that we have to separate these types of webinars, A&E firms compete under a completely different process. <clears throat> you respond to a request for proposals or a request for qualifications, and then you're gonna make a proposal based on your qualifications, and you don't have to necessarily be the low bidder. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely different process. Uh, with us, poor old contractors, it's all about the money. If we're not low bidder, we don't get the job, period, end of story. Will suppliers know ahead of time which subs will be bidding so suppliers can submit to them? Uh, it depends on uh, what the supplier is providing. Um, most water and wastewater treatment plant equipment suppliers, they track these jobs just as, just as uh, diligently as the contractors do. So yes, they know all about it. Uh, on bid day, when, when, when we are putting our bid together at, at, at our family business, um, we, we establish a list of all the materials we're gonna need. And then we make sure we have coverage. We reach out to them. But uh, it, it just depends on what, what material the supplier is gonna provide. If you're a special inspector welding and coating, do you have to have BDSA approved to work for the state? Uh, it depends, it'll be in the specifications. If, if, if normally most special inspectors, especially for welding and coating, do have to have specific uh, DSA and other uh, specified qualifications. And again, that will be in the specifications. Okay, forms 10H and 10K that relate to determining the fringe of benefits. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's because I have a bookkeeper and an office manager that takes care of that part. Um, I'd have to answer that one offline. I know, I know the, uh, the prevailing wage rate and certified payroll process can be confusing, but it is, uh, unfortunately, it's part of the process and it's a mandatory requirement. Uh, what about project management and construction management? It's the same as A and E. It depends. That depends on what type of project it is. If it's a building project, it'll be a separate RFP process. Caltrans now has a bid category under a prime where they'll provide what they call project management, and they require project management. And sometimes that is subbed out by the prime, but not always. Here's a good question that we fight with in the industry all the time. If a sub hires a fabrication job to fabricate item, do they have to pay prevailing wage? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on record and at risk by simply giving you my opinion and I can give you some, some fact. A private cabinet shop, for example, located in Fresno, They've been an open shop. They've been a family business for 50 years. They want to provide cabinets for a school job. No, they absolutely do not have to pay prevailing wage. However, there is a growing movement with organized labor to plug that gap. They've already done it with uh, concrete ready mix delivery trucks uh, for a hundred years a ready mix batch plant did not have to be union and pay a prevailing wage rate. The, uh, the building trades lobbied Sacramento and got that passed and got it included. So now that's one of the reasons why um, a, a truck driver driving a, a ready mix truck, uh, they get full Teamster scale, even if they're working in, in Modoc County. Um, 
My company's a site security, but we don't get any estimated hours and dates. Well, that requires a communication between you and the project manager or the estimator to find out what's the size of the job, how long is it going to last, and, uh, and, and get some specifics. You, uh, you're going to have to dig in for that. I didn't understand the 5% payment holdback. Can you explain a little more? It's simply called retention. The owner pays holds 5% of every month's progress payment to the owner, to the prime contractor, and it's called retention. And likewise, uh, all these uh, what we call flow down provisions, that same retention requirement, I will pass down to you in your subcontract that you have with me. I'm not going to pay you 100% of your payment because I didn't receive 100%. I got 95. So in other words, I hold 5% from your payment as well. And none of us get our retention payment until the job is finished. Are the DBE requirements for a DBE prime the same as uh, let's see. That one could be, uh, it depends on the contract. It will say on, on the contract if, if the DBE requirements, get DBE certification and, and usage of a DBE by a prime, it, it has to be uh, a certified firm and they have to be um, doing what they call worthwhile actual real work. So it's, it's, it's I'll, I'll take too much time answering that, but um, I'll try to answer that offline. Uh, trucking firms, uh, we never, we ne most contractors, I know the highway contractors, we don't build highways, by the way. Uh, but most of the your Caltrans highway contractors, they do not hire subcontracting trucking firms. They hire the trucking, they hire a trucking broker, and then they provide truckers on site to do the uh, excavation and off haul and, and, and in, inbound dirt. Uh, Jessica Borland, are you required to pay prevailing wage if you're on site installing the cabinets or seal? Absolutely, yes, correct. Okay, I think that's um, probably a good place to end the, the, the q and I hope I answered most of your questions. All right, moving on. Your scope letter. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let's skip. Let me go back here. Just some quick comments about finding work. We, are, we already talked about the, Cal, the Caltrans links. There's a, there's a publication called the Commerce Business Daily, which is online. The two that our firm uses the most is the Daily Pacific Builder and a Builders Exchange newsletter. Uh, Daily Pacific Builder and the Blue Book are both available online. They cost money. The Daily Pacific Builder is an industry trade, trade newspaper published every single business day of the year. The only time it doesn't publish is, I think the eight or nine major holidays. Uh, but again, both of those require uh, membership and they cost. Builders Exchange newsletters. I am a big fan of Builders Exchanges, having our families belong to ones for 60 years. They are the best bargain around and they have their own newsletter and they are localized. And that newsletter will carry a list of projects that, that uh, list all of the projects in that particular region being served by that builder's exchange. So I would strongly encourage uh, any of you to, if you're really serious and you are an ongoing business in providing construction services, the builder's exchange is a bargain. And of course, as I said, and as Tricia pointed out, with Caltrans has it, 
most, if not all, public works agencies now have online websites with a complete listing. Uh, one of the a very good examples, East Bay, Nud, East Bay Mud, another good one's Corps of Engineers, Cal and Caltrans, et cetera. So those are uh, ways to find work. Now, this is what we're talking about for a roadway project. In other words, this is unit price bidding. I'll go over how it's done tomorrow in more detail. What I'm just going to show you what it is this morning. But this is what I, as a prime, would have to fill out on bid day and turn it in. With inflation and the growth of California and the, and the cost of construction, this process has now become huge. A Caltrans project of 10, 15, 20 million, it would be absolutely common to have 100 to 200 to 300 bid items. So when you look at it, a perspective, and I'll put myself, I'll, I'll phrase my comments as, as the prime. When I have to fill out this type of a form and include a subcontractor list of everybody I'm gonna, every sub I'm gonna use, and all of the other forms that we do, this process has become incredibly complex. And Caltrans is one of the few agencies that has gone over to online bidding, electro electronic submittal of the bid. That's not how it used to be done. We did this all manually. We had a bid runner sitting in the city hall or the lobby of the Caltrans headquarters and with a, 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 a clipboard and all of these forms having to write in our numbers because as subcontractors, they don't want to get their numbers shopped or spread around. So they wait to the last minute to turn in their bids. And we're still calculating this on our spreadsheets and filling these unit prices out and then doing the extension over in the far right column. It's a complicated process to bid as a prime. And this is one of the reasons when I talk tomorrow, why it's so important that you send a proper scope letter. I don't want to be talking to any subcontractor on bid day. I don't have the time. Just another quick example. This is right from the Caltrans website. There you see bid item lead compliance system. LS, the unit of measure is the is uh, LS is the lump sum. EA is each. LF is lineal foot. CY is cubic yard. You get the drift. With heavy civil projects, this methodology, this type of a what we call unit bid, unit price bidding format, this is typical. The bad news about public works projects and bidding for them is that it can be complicated. The good news is it's pretty consistent through every agency. A BART project, a SMUD project, uh, Alameda County Transit Authority project. Um, they all have their setup quite similar to this, if not in fact identical. Where we see lump sum price, one price bidding is typically for the B licensed building projects. Okay. Here's your typical invitation from a from a contractor. And I'm going to go through these rather quickly because um, I want to point out specific things. For example, uh, this was uh, sent out by Tiger Construction out of Sacramento. 
They were looking, they were bidding on the Kings Beach Water Quality Improvement Project. They're looking for subs and suppliers for street sweeping, SWIP, water pollution, water pollution erosion control, trucking, concrete, asphalt, etc. They say they're willing to break items of work into smaller increments to assist DBEs and small subcontractors and suppliers of obtaining work. Contact them for details. There's the engineer's estimate for the overall job. But they also include, please note that this is a prevailing wage project. All subs will be required to enter our st standard contract and must be union or willing to sign a one-time job agreement. You will find this paragraph on virtually every Caltrans project prime notice to subs. And the reason being, it's just kind of the way things developed over 100 years. Most of your big A license road builders, they happen to be union. I don't know, it could be 100%, I'm not sure. I know it's over 95%. So that brings up an interesting question. If you're an open shop sub, are you willing to sign a one-time job agreement? If you are not, then you have no business bidding this job because you're wasting your time. And you haven't got that luxury to be able to afford that. Let's go to another one. I'll show you this one because it was had unique qualifications. Of it's here's an invitation that our firm put out put out a couple of years ago, eight years ago. We were bidding on a uh, the Helms Community Center for the city of San Pablo, and um, we described the work. We put a notice in there: a heavy bit volume and faxes on bid day. Uh, yeah, that's way back in the days of the dinosaur when we used to we get faxes. Uh, yes, I'll be bidding. No, I will not be bidding. But we put this in because in the specifications, it said the low bidder, the bids will be received on the date noted, but they're not going to award the contract for almost nine months. And as a subcontractor, as a contractor, all of you out there should be aware if you're not already, price protection is not always available. So we, we're just pointing that to them. Even though the city will award in June, construction will not be allowed to start until early 2013. All subs and suppliers must hold their prices through the end of the contract, which could be as late as January, February of 14. The city will not allow any price increases of any kind for labor or materials. That was in the specification. So how the heck do we protect ourselves? Well, we put in contingencies because if my lumber went up, if my concrete went up, if your electrical work went up, if your wages went up, doesn't matter. We do not get change orders after a contract is awarded for increases in cost of labor or materials. So remember, that's a very key point. When you're sending out a scope letter, you don't, you don't use a Excel template like I have here. This is simply an example of the information that you need to have on your letterhead when you're sending me a scope letter indicating that you intend to bid on a pending project, okay? And I think it's self-explanatory. The only thing this, this is uh, this template is four years old, so I do not have the DIR registration number requirement uh, that has to be on on today's bids. So let's look at a sample scope letter.
to whom it may concern. And that's done because that, this, this subcontractor is bidding to the field. They're bidding to all the primes. They list the job, and then they say, this is to confirm our quotation for your above residential project. Per plans and specs dated as prepared, we've noted addendums two through five. I should have highlighted that. Uh, that is a very key point. When you are bidding as a subcontractor on any project, if there are addendums, you need to make sure you specifically note that you have seen those addendums because I will hold you to whatever changes are on those addendums. If we get the job and you're low and we all get awarded the contract. So there's what he's including. There's his qualifications, exemptions, uh, exclusions, which is fine. And he points out that he's a non-union contractor. That's fine. I don't, I don't care as long as he pays prevailing wage because we happen to be an open shop prime contractor. And their exclusions, they should, exclusions should be typical for your particular type of scope of work. By the way, excluding retention, the 5% retention is not gonna fly. Here's a bid for a metal fabricator. I don't personally care for a detailed scope letter because it forces me to do a takeoff of all the structural steel members in the building. And I'm not a structural steel detailer, nor estimator, nor subcontractor. So what I want to see from you is this, <coughs> as a subcontractor is that you're furnishing all the metals as shown on the drawing for plans and tax. I notice that he includes the sales tax, which is good. I'll talk about that a little later. This guy has a ton of exclusions. Um, the more exclusions you put on your scope letter, the more I look at it with a raised eyebrow. Real nice, simple electrical sub bid. We will furnish as shown. Items 10, 41, 42, 43, 44. They acknowledge the five addendums were issued on that particular project. Clarifications, talks about submittals, warranties. He will do his, his own cleanup to a dumpster provided by others, namely me. Here's what he excludes, et cetera. Good bid. All that matters now is, is he the low electrician? Uh, item number 12 is, again, Trish has already uh, given it to you, helpful websites for public works. These are the types of handouts, these are the types of bids that you will be involved in if you're bidding on, as a subcontractor and for, uh, uh, Caltrans or any kind of a highway project and or any kind of a building project. Now, the building project will be the lump sum method, which I don't have time to go over today, but I will talk about it tomorrow. So hang on a second. I think I skipped the slide. Okay. Submitting your scope letter. Be as clear and concise as possible. Structure your pricing to match my bid format. Be sure you reference the spec section that applies to your work. Always include any and all applicable taxes and freight. You will not get taxes and freight included from you subcontractors, your suppliers. They will give you a quote that does not include tax. Well, don't, don't send that price to me or don't include it in your, in, your, in your own spreadsheet without making sure that you've got taxes and freight. 
because that just makes our contract negotiations that much more difficult. Do you have taxes and freight or not? Well, no, I don't know. The, the supplier didn't do it. Well, now we've got a problem. Always put it included in your number. Make sure you acknowledge the addendums. Let me know if there are any delivery restraints that could affect the schedule. Identify unloading requirements. Here's a good example. If you're a rebar, reinforcing steel subcontractor, and you're going to furnish, you're going to fabricate, furnish, and install all the rebar in the reinforced concrete. All right, we're not going to un unload that rebar by hand, are we? And you normally don't come with a crane. So you let me know in your scope letter, contractor to provide unloading of all rebar. It's a standard exclusion. It's a standard requirement. And all primes, we understand that. So I will have a crane there to unload your rebar. I'll put it close to the job, and then your people will have to pick up the bars and walk them out and put them into the forms. If appropriate, offer alternate pricing for partial scope, but be clear. And always state how long your price is good for. Your price has to be as good as long as the bid documents state. And they will always say so that uh, the prime price must hold for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. It'll be there. That number will be there. Yours will follow. And I will not accept any, any exceptions to that rule. If your price has to go up, you and I have a big problem. Worst practices. Don't bid the alternate items unless you're approved by the design firm, the A&E. Don't give me that detailed quantity takeoff bid form unless the bid form calls for it. Don't exclude taxes and freight. Don't expect that you're going to dictate payment terms. There will be no upfront money. You will pay prevailing wages. You will not get any money. Uh, you will not be able to say, uh, I exclude retention. That, it just doesn't happen. Um, don't wait till 15 minutes before the bids are due to submit your price because chances are 95 to 98 percent, I won't use your number. I don't have the time. We bid a job for the city of uh, Dublin Unified School District about, I don't know, three or four years ago. That was $70 million gymnasium. We got 300 subbids. So having to read those, categorize them, classify them, determine the low bidder, do apples to apples scope comparison, and then list that low, low subcontractor. It's just, it's a lot of work. So don't expect to talk to me on bid day either. On bid day, finalize your price, send it to us about 45 to 60 minutes early. The next day, contact the low bidder and request results for your work. How do you find out if the low bidder? It's in the website. It's public record information. By the way, if you are bidding a local job for one of your local agencies and you want to see, watch a bid opening, prior to COVID anyway, um, it's public. You can go down to BART headquarters, you can go uh, um, to Central Sanitation District on bid day and go into the boardroom and you can watch them open bids from the prime contractor. If they used your number and listed you, send a little short note and, and uh, follow the owner's website to see bid results. That covers the basics, the lo logistics, the methodology and the timeline of how these types of projects are bid. And I think I want to close with, with, with making this point again, and that's simply, <clears throat> if you, as subcontractors, if you want to be competitive, you have to do a, a, a good estimate. 
and being certified as a DBE does not get you the job. I'm not going to get the project unless I'm the low bidder. And if I don't use the low electrician, the low painter, the low plumber, the low asphalt person, the mathematics tells you I won't be probability I'm not going to be the low bidder. So we all have to be competitive. And you need to be bidding for plans and specifications. And the more structured and professional your scope letter is, and I get it early, you're, you've opened up that first line of communication because I'm looking at this letter and I'm saying, ah, here's somebody who knows how the process works and they brought up a good question. I'll probably call you back or email you and say, uh, do you have the electrical demolition included it with your electrical bid or will you be providing it? Now we have dialogue. So credibility is everything, but price is the final judge. So with that, I will take more Q&A if you have any. Thanks, Ed. Let me, um, let me thank you so much for going over all of this important information. And I just want to go over some of the upcoming events. As I mentioned in the beginning, let me get my video on here just for a second. <clears throat> As I mentioned in the beginning, this is just the first event um, of a four part event series that we're lucky enough to have Ed presenting for. Um, so this is the intro one. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. same time, um, he's going to dive into estimating and bidding. Um, and then the follow up will be uh, next Wednesday, week from today, also 10 a.m. And then he's going to close it out with a managing a public works project, um, also at 10 a.m. on the 30th. Thursday. So uh, you can find all these on our website, a link to Eventbrite where you can register for the rest of them. So if you like what you heard today and you found it useful, go ahead and sign up for the rest of them. Um, we also, of course, have different webinars coming up um, on August 5th. I believe that's coming up pretty soon. We have a how to do business with the state of California webinar and a government contracting web series, which we're kicking off on the 18th of August. And we partnered with the uh, SBA and the Department of General Services as well as Caltrans for that event as well, uh, for those events. So do check our website, norcalptech.org slash calendar. I saw we had some questions about upcoming events, so you can find all of our information on our website. Um, and uh, we have plenty of time for questions now. Just one more reminder that the questions um, will be answered if they're sent into the Q&A feature, not the chat feature. And it's looking good, so let's get to our questions. Um, and remember, just a little word of advice. When you're asking questions, try to be specific to, um, specific to how you want them answered. So if, if you want Patricia to answer a question, for instance, um, or uh, you know, just try to be specific with the question, but also ask questions that are general enough that you think everyone could get use of it. Um, if it's if it's too specific to your circumstance, then you can send it to me, and I will try to get a, a, a personalized answer for you in your specific business. <clears throat> so, Ed, do you want to take it like you were doing before? Do you 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 seem to be going through the questions yourself pretty pretty well. Do you want to do that, or do you want me to read them out for you? No, no, I, I've got it up on the screen right now. So I'll start with Claudine. What's the implication of a one-time bid agreement signing if you are not union? Well. The implication is that uh, it, it, you are signing a, a contract with that particular trade. Your people will be uh, paying a monthly dues into that <coughs> union. You will be paying all of their benefit payments into the trade union. Um, the disadvantage is if you, if you are signing a one-time agreement, and I'm, this is, this is a, <laughs> a touchy subject, okay? If you have no intent of staying in the union, trust me, the building trades will question you on that and they will know. If you don't, if you're only gonna do this the one time, all those benefits that are paid into the union, your people will never see them because they're only gonna see them if they're vested and they have to be members for five, five to 10 years. So, it's a very distinct disadvantage. Number two, um, because you are a one-timer, the union is gonna put you at the bottom of the priority for sending you, you're gonna get what we call the bottom of the barrel off the bench. 
it's it's not a good it's not a great deal um, but if you need the work and it and you can live with it being one time and you can live with the hassle um, it's what you're going to have to do the unfortunate atmosphere that exists in the state of California is that the building trade unions control Sacramento 100%. And so it's, 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 we're not going to get any relief on this. Um, most of the contractors that do the, as I said, the Caltrans work, they're already union and that, that's their choice and that's fine. I have no problem with that. But if it, it makes it difficult for small firms because what can happen is that your people, they get a higher rate. And if you go to do your private work, uh, you, you can't charge that same rate to a, a private owner, at least most small time owners, um, such as a doctor's office or a private building. And um, it will affect your ability to get work. Depends on your location. Uh, enough said about that. Uh, what's the most in demand certification pursue? DBE. Uh, well, the DBE is self-explanatory. I think that pretty much covers it. MBE is not much use anymore in minority-owned business. And DVBE is a disabled veteran. Uh, that, that can be very advantageous. If you are a veteran and you've been disabled through your military service, uh, the feds in particular are, and the state of California, uh, Department of General Services, are both big on uh, DVBE participation. Um, you mentioned that past bids were always faxed. How are they currently submitted? All right, past sub bids are always faxed. Before, before the electronic bidding for Caltrans, we have to fill out all the paperwork, put it in a manila envelope and have a bid runner down there it, at City Hall or the school district office. And they're sitting there with a cell phone and a uh, and, and a big binder and folder with all of this stuff in, a, in an envelope ready to seal once we are talking to them, giving them the final numbers. So if you really want to have a laugh, when I started in the business, my father, it, we, we had to go to a payphone to call the office to get our, our numbers. That's how we've, uh, how everything's changed. What are the requirements for bidding on post-construction cleaning or progressive cleaning? Uh, that's just simply, that's, that's part of the general conditions that the, the prime will include. I've got to clean up the job and I'll be looking for somebody to give me an hourly rate. Um, I have a hard time understanding scopes that are requested from primes. I guess it depends on what you're talking about. Progressive cleaning is once a week. Uh, there are specifications, there are many projects that have a specific spec section that says contractors shall keep building premises brood clean every week. Well, that means a laborer is going to be out there with a push broom and a, and a, and a, and a uh, trash barrel bu bucket to keep the building clean for safety purposes. Um, that, that'll be part of my expense. And uh, if you uh, provide for a cleaning service, uh, talk to me about your hourly rate. What if the city made change orders and the wage went up during the project? Can we charge the city? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, we just had that issue come up with one of our clients where the construction manager tried to s tell the contractor that, uh, well, we're, the, the only rates, the only rates that apply are the wage wage rates that were in in effect at the time. Now that has nothing to do with the owner. You have to pay prevailing wage rate, and if the prevailing wage rate for a carpenter is now seventy dollars an hour, that's what you pay, and they can't deny that. A road project, low bid contractor one, and then with work changes, costs more than the other company's bid. What happens or is this okay? Well, of course it's okay. The contract's been awarded and change orders are change orders. Their ultimate bid is more. It doesn't mean that necessarily, people have a bad, a very bad impression, incorrect impression of what change orders are. They're not contrary to popular belief, a 
prime or subcontractor trying to stick it to the owner. Change orders are reflective of changes of scope. And if the work scope changes, they are entitled to more money. How do we get on a distribution list for coming up A&E workshops? Uh, PTAC, just keep in tune with uh, James and, uh, and uh, our other uh, counselors here. Is it safe to send a bid a couple of days early? Will I be sending my bid number to be shopped right? Absolutely. I wouldn't send it too early. I would send it on the morning. If On bid day, if the bid is at two o'clock, I'd send it at 11. I wouldn't send it the day before. The unfortunate thing, folks, is human beings have frailties, okay? We have excellent moral, ethical general contractors who would never shop bids. And I assume you all know what I'm talking about, shopping a bid is. Um, yet, there are a number of general contractors out there who have no problem revealing your price to your competitor. Uh, it's done in the residential. Uh, in fact, you'll see it all the time. Uh, you get a quote to, to paint your house for $10,000, and then uh, that painter came out, measured up, asked what colors you wanted, took a look at the furniture settings, et cetera, and worked up a nice little proposal. Then you call up another painter and, and say, uh, come over and look at my house, and then you hand them the first painter's bid. It's done all the time in the residence. Well, it's very unethical, it's immoral, but um, so unfortunately, it's not illegal. In the construction industry, we, the subcontractors' uh, methodology evolved to prevent shopping by simply timeline. They just turn in their bids at the very last minute. The same thing happens with suppliers. Uh, Switchgear for electricians, those suppliers, they wait till the very last minute to give the, their bids to the electricians because there's four or five electricians bidding on this job and there's all kinds of suppliers bidding to all of them. So I think that answers all the questions. Um, I can be reached at ed at norcalptac.org. I hope you enjoyed the workshop and uh, hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, Ed. Um, we really appreciate having you here. And thanks uh, to you as well, Patricia Silva from Caltrans District 2. If anyone has any other questions, um, you can feel free to email me at info at norcalptac.org. Um, if it's about the presentation, I can direct them uh, towards Ed. Um, if there was a question you didn't get answered here. Um, if you'd like something more in depth, a one-on-one -on -one session with one of our procurement specialists, um, we would uh, like you to apply on our website at norcalptech.org. Hit that red apply now button and fill out steps one through seven. Um, uh, and if you're not in our service area, just a reminder that there's PTACs across the country. You just type in find a PTAC to directly to the APTAC page. You can put in your state and your locality. Uh, uh, you're going to get a, uh, a link uh, in an email soon coming from Eventbrite, info at norcalptech.org. Um, it's going to have a link to a survey. It's a, it's a satisfaction survey. It's very short. You can fill it out anonymously, and it really helps us out. You just tell us how you felt about the webinar today. It um, helps us uh, improve our services and also keep, uh, keep our services funded for the future, which benefits everyone. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there will be a recording of today's presentation, and the slides will be posted. So uh, this email you'll receive, uh, you're going to get a link where to find these resources. They're going to be on our website at norcalpedac.org. Um, under the resources tab in past webinars. So once again, um, thanks so much for joining our, uh, the first of our four part series with Ed Duarte and Public Works Contracting. Um, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>